people back home will say, oh, not just another convention. <laughs> Watch. Brothers and sisters, I am so proud to stand with the working men and the working women gathered here, and I am honored to serve together with all of you. Look around you. This is America's soul. This is our future. Future as a movement, as a nation. And our challenge, our responsibility, yours and mine, is to join together with millions more like this and build real power. And that is what we will do. We will take back America for the American worker. So, Fred, you've really seen all sides of this picture. I, I you also have. worked with the AFL CIO. Yeah, yeah. So, you've had labor, community. Um, what's new about this moment um, in comparison to when you came in, came in, maybe as a student organizer? I think we're in a crisis, right? Our economy is in a crisis, collective bargaining is in crisis. And what that means for workers is that even though their productivity has been going up, their wages have remained flat and their quality of life, you know, hasn't gotten any better. Talk a bit, Nick, about how your work day is spent. What's it like and is it different from your parents, your father, grandfather? So I work at a titanium foundry. Um, it's still pretty dangerous. Um, the difference is, is that we have the right to speak up. Um, the workers are very, uh, the workers actually fight back. If we see a safety issue, we have the power um, with the United Steel workers to actually speak up. Um, the thing that I am noticing now is though, is that we are kind of going back in time. We're working longer days. Um, we're giving up some of the things that, that the union fought for all these years. And a lot of it's because we have layoffs and the layoffs are making the workers work harder, work longer. Lourdes, tell me a little bit about your work. For a live-in uh, job, that means you stay in the house of the patient for 24 hours. If it is uh, full-time, you can work there for four to five days. And for a uh, reliever, as uh, we say, that is from two days to three days a week. Do you get to sleep? Do you get to rest? Uh, yeah, but it depends on the uh, case of the patient. There are patients which are uh, difficult to handle, especially those uh, that are of G-tube, because you have to reposition the patient every two hours. So you cannot sleep continuously, and that is really very difficult. Well, when I returned from work after the ULP strike, which is a protected um, lawfully protected strike that I can take part of. They, they don't have the right to replace me, they don't have the right to fire me. But two weeks after that, um, I was called into the management office and they actually fired me for my attendance on their calls. And the dates that were listed on my exit interview were actually the dates that I was on strike. Y por eso yo ahora sí que como nos despidieron ya de King Carguas, del Carguas, nos despidieron, entonces nosotros estamos Ya ahora sí de ahora sí de brigadista en el King Carguas porque pues ahora sí no teníamos ahora sí otra salida porque ellos ellos nos están ayudando no porque pues. So I was fired from my workplace um, for organizing and as of now I'm part of the brigade leadership program with the Clean Car Wash campaign um, and you know because they 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 would take advantage of us at work. Queremos. Algo de protección para la cara. Okay, we want some pre some, Queremos uh, protections. Like guantes, gear, gloves. guantes, botas, mascarilla Boots, para la nariz, uh, para el ácido. Masks porque, to work with the acid. Porque el ácido nos hace mucho daño para los ojos. Because the acid uh, really hurts our eyes a lot. El jabón nos saca como costra, el jabón. And the soap um, sometimes um, gives us rashes or ¿Por qué? Uh, blisters. Porque no nos dan guantes. Because they don't give us gloves. 
no nos aguante y luego ahora sí que la, por la, la sombra, la sombra queremos porque pues, nos quema mucho el sol. Y es lo que nosotros estamos ahora sí luchando para que se nos cumpla esa, esa ley que que haya para los carguacheros porque todos los compañeros están en la sombra. Están... That's what we're fighting for, um, for, for, for that to be one uh, for car wash workers. No hay una ley que protege. Por eso estamos luchando There para no que... There are no laws that protect us, that's what we're fighting. So one of the things that's a problem now for the labor movement is the ultimate power of the financial community that controls so much in the nation's wealth, that have fed the 1% at the top have tried to drive down living standards. They've used the political power they can buy to try and influence the political system. That's the reason workers' wages aren't climbing while the top 10% have had a 40% increase in their income since 2009. That imbalance can't survive. You can't sustain a democracy when you got 80% of the people whose living standard is falling, 15% whose living standard is stagnant, and 5% whose living standard is exploding in the upper, upper echelons. But the real base reality is we need to build a movement. We need to build a movement of all people who share common values. And to do that with the labor movement, whether it's people of color, whether it's women's movement, environmental movement, anti-poverty movement, all of the various movements that share our values, we need to come together and understand they're attacking us all. They're not, and if they do us individually, we'll all die individually. You can't talk about an economy that works for all if you don't deal with the pathways to poverty. I think in many ways, if you think of immigration being a result of globalization, so is mass incarceration. Because just as globalization kind of devastated economies in the global south, mass incarceration has devastated urban areas. And in response to devastation, the elite went towards mass incarceration. And so it's important to see the ties and trying to, to address that. I am very proud to welcome Lee Saunders. He is president of AFSCME, which is the federal, state, county, and municipal employees union. He's been one of those speaking from the stage about the resolutions that are being passed here at this uh, convention. One of those resolutions in particular, one of many firsts, had to do with incarceration. Lee, welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, talk about that resolution that passed opposing mass incarceration and the significance of it uh, to your union. We represent the correction officers within our union. And one of the things that we wanted stressed in that, uh, in that resolution was that uh, our correction officers are doing a great job and they work in, under very, very difficult circumstances. And right now with the state budget cuts, with, uh, money, with the resources being short in state and local governments across the country, you've got problems with staffing levels. You've also got a move by the private sector uh, to privatize correctional facilities. Uh, that makes no sense to us at all. Uh, because when you privatize and you, in, and you entertain having companies come in to make money, then their ambition then, it seems to me, would to be to keep people incarcerated rather than for looking at alternatives. So you're finding a shared interest between the people facing incarceration, the communities and families they're coming from, and your workers. You make it sound easy, but this has not been simple, I suspect. No, it hasn't, it hasn't been simple, but uh, the communities are coming together. We're forming coalitions, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, with family members, with other uh, with other organizations to oppose, oppose the privatization of prisons because there's a, there's a direct conflict of interest. So we're trying to work together with our communities, listening to their concerns, but they're listening to ours also. That's part of what's been so inspiring about being here is you walk into that convention hall and oh my gosh, I mean the power of the labor movement is enormous and if we can be smart about how we leverage and weave together the power of the worker center movement and new sort of initiatives that are moving right now to change our economy um, and weave that together with the existing infrastructures of labor, there's so much that's possible. And what happened at the AFL-CIO convention this year that was so significant where all of this is concerned? The biggest news coming out of the convention was a, a resolution that we call anyone can join and everyone should. This notion that yes we need to protect and expand collective bargaining because that's where workers actually get to confront their boss and talk about higher pay. But we need to have many more strategies for raising pay for making sure that there's retirement or health care or sick days and that we only do by being agnostic about what form it's going to take you know uh, we need to take off our organizational spanks you know just see what form our movement needs to take 
And we only do that by inviting people in and letting them decide, okay, here's what we need and here's going to be our, the best way for us to exercise power. The reason this is so different is because, at least in this country for many decades, union organizing has been in the workplace yeah. of the workers that are covered by the same collective bargaining agreement as you are, workplace by workplace. Nothing to do with community and folks at home. The independent contractors of the Taxi Workers Alliance mm -hmm. have come into this relationship mm -hmm. with this decades-old traditional mm -hmm. labor federation. Mm -hmm. Explain just <laughs> what the significance is. Well, in many ways, it's flipping the script, you know, because I think for generations, we've really been used to workers gaining collective bargaining recognition, then a union coming in, right, winning a campaign. Um, and once you establish that vote, then you're a bona fide union, and, and then you get to join. You, you can affiliate with the AFL-CIO. The way that we've done it is we're not waiting to win collective bargaining recognition. We're establishing ourselves as a mass-based, independent, democratic workers' organization and through our affiliation of the AFL-CIO, you know, building our political power, our numbers, our strength, our resources to one day win collective bargaining. This is the first time there's ever been a delegation of domestic workers to the AFL convention, so that in and of itself is historic. And our partnership with the AFL-CIO has been historic on a number of fronts. And Really, the convention, the, a the ILO Convention on Domestic Work, was one of the first ways in which we started working together. In 2011, the international body that establishes global standards for workers passed its very first convention on domestic work, covering the 100 million domestic workers who are working around the world. And we partnered with the AFL-CIO to be a part of that process of designing and, and uh, passing the convention. And we were the first labor federation in the world to have an actual domestic worker on the official negotiations and delegation to the ILO for this convention. And we ended up being a model for other labor movements around the world on that. Uh, Tafari Gabre is now nominated as the executive vice president the first officer in the history of the American labor movement who is an immigrant himself and who is someone who has fought for and uh, built unions uh, throughout his career. The fact that uh, at the very highest levels, the AFL-CIO is opening its doors to people of color, to immigrants, to women, to young workers, reflects that the labor movement is doing the right thing and is serious about embracing a change agenda. You go back to a moment in history where all those good things happened, but they didn't include everybody. And they, in particular, didn't include workers of color, domestic workers, farm workers. Um, I sometimes have the feeling that the labor movement's asking for an opportunity to have a do-over. Uh, is it, do it right this time? Do it different with everybody involved? You raised a very important point. When modern labor law was developed in this country, when the National Labor Relations Act was passed in the 1930s, is it explicitly excluded most workers of color, domestic workers, farm workers. It even included public sector workers, government workers. And now we need to correct that wrong. We need to go back and organize workers who have been historically excluded from protection of the American labor movement. And that's what we see today. When the domestic workers take center stage, when day laborers take center stage, uh, this is a new day for the American labor movement. What's the union meant to you? You were a miner. Someone told me one time, said this is a, kind of like the family business, although I don't like it to be called a business, right? But they were making a point that this has been in our family forever. This is something very precious to us, and we have to preserve it because it does so much good and has done so much for so many. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me.